Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to be using this portion down here. Right. So you guys can have what's going on there. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So let's suppose that I have a buffer and it is sending data over some arbitrary length of any circuit or trace to uh, the gate input of another gate. And I'm going to assume buffers. That's just simplest gate. Now, the voltage that you see on this line is reference to ground. So any time I have two wires like this that I'm transmitting data, uh, you have a transmission line. Now, the voltage along this transmission line is the ratio of the voltage to the current. And this transmission line has something called the characteristic impedance. And by convention, Z sub zero uh, is the variable used to represent characteristic impedance. So the ratio of the voltage along this line to the current along the line is the characteristic impedance. And for printed circuit board traces, it's around 150 ohms, somewhere along that line. Very typical of the trace. Now, it turns out that the waveforms that you see along this transmission line Uh, is somewhat odd and not what you would expect. So let's take a, a look at this. showing here is uh, a driver. This would be like that buffer. And they're showing a evidence equivalent circuit of uh, that particular device. So the device is going to generate a voltage and it's got an output impedance R source. And we're assuming that at time t equals zero that switch closes. So that should send the logic one down that line. Now, the voltage that actually goes down that line in terms of magnitude is not V source because you actually have a voltage divider here. And what you've got is that voltage is V source times, and you have a voltage divider. Z out divided by Z out plus R source. So the characteristic impedance in this uh, resistance, this output impedance of the driver, uh, forms a voltage divider. So you get something less than V source propagating down the line. So the question is, what does this voltage look like at various points all, along the transmission line? And again, I'm assuming this transmission line is of arbitrary length. Well, the speed of light is limited, so that says that there's going to be a finite amount of time 
that it takes for uh, the voltage that you apply here, or logic one or logic zero, <coughs> to propagate down the line. And let's assume capital T is the amount of time it would take to get from a driver to a receiver. And what you're interested in is the time between 0 and 2t. And the reason why it's 2t will become apparent shortly. So the question is, if I close this switch at time t equals 0, I should immediately see this voltage here as determined by the voltage divider at the output terminals. But what about some distance down the line? What does it look like? Well, it turns out that this is what it's going to look like. Uh, V1, uh, that's the voltage on the transmission line some distance down from the driver. And so here's the voltage that's going to be propagating down the transmission line. Uh, it's going to take some time, let's say T1, to get to that particular point. So there's zero voltage until that amount of time elapses, and then the voltage is this at that particular point on the transmission line. So all along the transmission line, it doesn't instantaneously go to that voltage value. There's a certain, if you will, propagation delay. Uh, this point right here, we're going to call that voltage V2. That's further down the transmission line. It's going to take longer for the voltage to get down there. So there's more time elapsed. And then this voltage appears at that particular point. So if that transmission line is arbitrary length, I can pick various points going down the transmission line, and this is the voltage that I would see if I had closed that switch at time t. So, okay. So now. take up half the space here and mount this thing. You would think that they would mount it out that way and then you could extend it out like that, but no. Okay, so let's see if I can get another half of this thing. look at this circuit. Now it's the same sort of thing except uh, this is now a finite length transmission line. And you'll see that there is a load impedance. This would represent, for example, the input impedance of this gate right here. And you see that the value of that load impedance is equal to the characteristic impedance of the line. So in that particular special case, you actually see the same characteristic at points along the transmission line. So if this goes on for some arbitrary distance, and this is a finite length, and it happens to be that the point along the transmission line where I'm going to measure V2 happens to be where I put that load in pieces, that I'm going to see the same voltage characteristic going down the transmission line. Okay, now, it turns out that I'm going to have to deal with reflections.
by reflections is I'm going to be sending a voltage down this transmission line. It's going to get to this point. And there may be a voltage that goes back the other way from right to left. And that can cause rather odd effects in how this transmission line will act. The first case I want to look at is I want to take a finite length transmission line, except put a short circuit here instead of a convenience. Now you would expect with a short circuit that when I close that switch T equals zero, that everywhere along the line I have no output. That's what short circuits do. Now, not so fast. So here's my finite length transmission line, and now I put a short circuit here. At time t equals zero, I'm going to close the switch. So uh, what I'm going to see is that voltage propagating down the transmission line. So it's going to go all the way down the transmission line. And um, in this particular example, they assume that R source equals Z out just to make things convenient. Because with uh, this equal to Z source, this is V source times one half. So I've got half this voltage propagating down the line. And we're going to assume it takes capital T time to get down to this particular point. So I'm going to have some finite voltage down to where I get to point T. But now what's going to happen is I'm going to get a reflection. And the reflection, because you have to satisfy Kirchhoff's voltage law, it's going to be of the opposite polarity. So I may send, let's say, 3 volts down, and the reflection is going to be minus 3 volts. So I send down 3 volts. I'm getting minus 3 volts coming back. Plus 3 and minus 3 cancel. So let's look at this point right here first. It's going to take almost T time units to get down there. V2 is just before that short circuit. So I don't get anything. All of a sudden it jumps up to V source divided by 2. And then I hit the short circuit. I get the reflection minus 3 volts coming back. 3 volts going down, minus 3 coming back, they cancel. So you see a brief blip here. Do you see that? Now, this is about halfway down the line. So it's 0 to t over 2. Then it goes to the v source divided by 2. It's down to t. Minus 3 starts coming back. It's going to take t time units to get back before this goes to 0. And then here, at these terminals, it takes T units going down, and the minus 3 is going to take T units to come back. So it isn't until 2T that that goes to 0. So what this is showing you is that even though I have a short circuit here, 
instantaneously at every point along the transmission line, you do not get zero volts. It's a time delay involved. The largest time delay takes T units to get it down and T units to get back. It's 2T before the voltage here actually goes to zero. It's not instantaneous. Now, granted, we're talking about very short times here. We're not talking about capital T being five seconds or something like that. We may be talking about tens of nanoseconds. Nevertheless, this is the voltage characteristic that you're going to see. And the width of the pulse decreases symmetrically about capital T as I move further down the transmission. Let's take the opposite case. I'm going to have, instead of a short circuit at the end of the transmission line, I'm going to have an open circuit. Now you would expect with an open circuit that instantaneously I should see that voltage V source over 2 everywhere along the line. That's not exactly correct. This is actually what you do get. getting V source over 2. Uh, first of all, if this is an open circuit, you would expect that the voltage here would be equal to that. But that's not quite true instantaneously. I'm going to get V source over 2 going down to C time units. And believe it or not, even though you have an open circuit, Kirchhoff's voltage law will be satisfied you do get a reflection even with an open circuit. What gets reflected back, however, now is plus V source over 2. So V source over 2 goes down the transmission line. What gets reflected back is another V source over 2, or V source, eventually will appear here after 2T time units. So you would expect that at these terminals you would instantaneously see the source voltage. This is an open circuit line. That's not entirely correct. Look at this point about halfway down. It goes to V source over 2 after some time. At T, you hit the open circuit, you get the reflection back. It takes T time units to get there, and then it goes to V source over 2. Down here at the end of this finite transmission line, it takes, where this is measured just prior to this. So just prior to T time units, it goes to V source over 2. You get the reflection that adds to that. And so shortly thereafter, you get V source at the open end. So you're always going to get a reflection. Now, why is all of this important? Well, for the following reason. We've looked at the two cases here. And I'm going to shortly show you how you can determine what that reflected voltage coming back is. But let's look at this situation right here. I have a finite length transmission line. I have a finite load of pitch. Non zero. <coughs> but it's not infinite. In this particular case, our source is going to be the characteristic impedance divided by 3. I'm going to close the switch to time t equals 0. The load impedance is 3 times z0, the characteristic impedance. So this load no longer matches the characteristic impedance. And it's also different than the source. That's what you get. This 
this is at the terminals. This is halfway down the transmission line. And this is where the load reduces. is. Now, bear in mind that the source voltage that I've got is supposed to be of an appropriate level to generate a valid logic one voltage level. Uh, I may have voltage levels, particularly down here, that are not high enough for a valid logic one, but too high for a valid logic zero. What happens if I have a logic gate connected here? It's not going to see valid logic ones or valid logic zeros. In fact, here is an example of just that phenomenon. Um, if these are like uh, HCT, high speed CMOS with a TTL input gate, look at the input to this gate. That's not a valid logic one voltage load for an HCT gate operating at five volts. So there's a period of time where it's not logic zero, it's not logic one. Um, down here at this gate, there's no problem. So we looked at this uh, reflection, and there's a way that you can determine what the uh, reflection is going to be. with this reflection coefficient. And the Greek letter rho uh, is used as the variable to indicate the reflection coefficient. The reflection coefficient tells you how much of the voltage at a particular point is going to get reflected. So rho here is equal to z termination minus z zero over z termination plus z zero. And let me make sure I got those signs right. I did. Z termination is the value of your load impedance. In this particular example, um, here, Z term would be three times Z zero. So you can figure out what the reflection coefficient is. So the way this thing is going to work is I'm going to have a voltage value that propagates down the transmission line. The reflection coefficient times that value tells you how much is going to be reflected back the other way. Now you're going to have a reflection coefficient at this end too. So whatever voltage is coming back from right to left gets multiplied by that reflection coefficient and gets reflected back that way. So you go with a ping pong effect back and forth, back and forth with these reflected waves until eventually it settles down to some value, typically after 2T. That can be um, really problematic, and I'll show you an example in a minute, but I want to look at uh, a couple of special cases here. So here's your formula for the reflection coefficient. Z term equals zero, which is a short circuit. What's the reflection coefficient? Negative one is one. What is it? One. Negative one. Negative one. 
The other case is Z term equals infinity, so you have an open circuit. And in that particular case, what's wrong? So if you look at those coefficient values and realize that the magnitude of the voltage getting reflected is rho times the voltage at that particular point, those waveforms that we saw up in the open circuit and the short circuit now make sense. So rho here is going to be plus or minus one. Now in some cases if you have severe mismatches you can run into all kinds of problems like this one. If you look at the uh, reflection coefficients at the termination end which is plus one and at the terminals of the driver it's minus 0.88 this is the waveform that you actually get, and notice you're getting negative voltages. So the question is, how do you handle this? Let me go back to um, uh, this circuit right here. Uh, if this is a CMOS type gate, one of those that doesn't have a TTL compatible input, that input impedance is very high, almost infinity. So it's equivalent to like an open circuit. We saw that you would get no reflection if the load impedance down here was equal to the characteristic impedance. So the way that you handle this as if the end of the transmission line, you put what is known as a termination network. what one looks like and you can buy these in small outline uh, integrated circuit packages. It's a split resistor. Uh, this is typically 220 ohms, this is 330 ohms and The uh, equivalent of penis there is around 120 ohms or so. Now we stated before that the transmission line characteristic impedance for a printed circuit board trace is typically around 150 ohms, so that's a reasonably good match. So you're going to wind up with a situation where your load impedance matches your characteristic impedance, which minimizes these transmission line effects. Now, um, if you take a PC like that one there and you open it up, uh, you'll find at the bottom of the uh, case is a large printed circuit board, which is commonly referred to as the motherboard. And you will find that the that's where your address bus is, your data bus, command and control signals, and there will be connectors where you can hook in additional memory, the processor, input output devices, and so forth. Once you get more than an inch, or well, let's say 
three or four inches long for a PC board trace, transmission line effects may come up to bite you, and you may have to do something. So on those motherboards, they will actually solder on termination networks to minimize transmission line effects. Here's a case where you are almost always going to need a transmission line, without exception. You ever seen these uh, where you've got two printed circuit boards and you've got a large flat ribbon cable that connects the two printed circuit boards together? You ever seen that? You got a transmission line there. And so at the receiving end, you better plan on installing transmission line uh, termination networks or you're going to have all sorts of problems exchanging data between the boards. So that's the one case where you definitely want to consider using transmission line termination networks. Canito, what are your questions? No idea why they asked you this question. So there's the uh, basic architecture of the configurable logic block, and you have three LUTs. Uh, you have four inputs and a single output. So this is a 16 by 1, 16 by 1, and 8 by 1. What else we got? zero points. <laughs> no, I, I'll take care of that. But thank you for reminding me. What else we got? 
Same as everything except there's more questions because there's more time. So I can ask more. 30 questions. Comprehensive. However, you know there's going to be some questions on transmission line effects because you haven't been tested on So I would think that you would probably want to be familiar with that. Just say. And is there anything in particular that you would also like to harp on in terms of the exam and what's expected? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Uh, I missed the lecture because I was sick, but uh, information on JTAG. On, on what? JTAG. Oh, on JTAG? Ooh, yeah. That's a big topic. Uh, can you narrow that down? Uh, should I just like, review the slides on Canvas? <laughs> well, let's see. What's important about JTAG? <laughs> Scan. Our boundary scan. You'll discover why it is the preferred test method for a wide variety of applications. Historically, the most straightforward way to test electronic systems has been functional test. As the name implies, it means exercising a system as it is expected to be used in a target application. Though this approach continues to have merit, it has some significant drawbacks. First, it may be difficult to replicate a functional setup that sufficiently mimics the end application. Second, sufficiently testing the operational space of systems with even moderate complexity can be very difficult. An alternative to verifying functional operation is structural testing. This method tests individual partitions instead of looking at the system as a whole. It enables a more thorough testing that can verify corner cases, which are difficult to access using only functional tests. Structural tests also has problems to overcome. Gaining access to internal nodes is a challenge. One traditional method for accessing internal nodes is employing a fixture with multiple electrical contacts, touching down on exposed metallic pads. This fixture is commonly called a bed of nails. Unfortunately, these fixtures are costly to fabricate and difficult to make a solid connection when there are many points to access simultaneously. This method becomes even more problematic as circuit technology shrinks with a higher reliance on multiple layered boards. It makes internal access almost impossible as nodes are buried under packages such as ball grid arrays. Boundary scan is an ingenious approach to structural testing that overcomes these challenges. Instead of relying on mechanical connections for access, it adds dedicated test circuitry to the system's ICs using special registers inserted at the I.O. pins. These registers can observe data on the I.O. pins and they can be used to override drive signals, providing test stimulus to the circuit. It's this combination of stimulating and observing internal nodes that provides a powerful mechanism for accurate structural testing. To gain test access to these registers, there's a separate serial data chain independent of the functional paths. Test setup information flows into the chain's input, propagating to the chain's output. If there are multiple RCs with boundary registers, they can be concatenated to make a longer chain. This same data chain is also used to offload measured data. Typical boundary scan registers can have four different types of operations. One operation allows data to pass through the registers transparently without modification. This is the typical state of the circuit during normal functional operation. Another operation captures data coming into the register without changing its value. This is how test data is observed. A third operation updates the output of the register, disregarding the data coming into the register. This is how stimulus is applied to the circuit under test. 
The fourth operation executes the serial shift, enabling test access to each register. Shifting the test response from the boundary registers into an offboard register allows it to be scanned to compare to the expected response, hence the name boundary scan. A critical issue with boundary scan implementation is coordination between organizations. When the test department decides to utilize boundary scan, they need to work with the board developers to add it to the design. Next, IC manufacturers need to have boundary scan registers built into the devices they provide. Finally, someone needs to provide software tools that can gather the information from these different sources and create a program. To facilitate information exchange between these organizations, a standard has been developed for boundary scan. Established in 1990 by a team of industry representatives called the Joint Test Access Group, it became the IEEE 1149.1 standard. The standard is often referred to simply as JTAG. JTAG is especially important to IC manufacturers because it enables them to provide a consistent boundary scan configuration that's readily usable by many different customers in a variety of applications. Since the establishment of JTAG, a growing list of commercial devices includes boundary scan. This has expanded its usage into many different applications. It continues to be an efficient method for verifying the electrical connections between IC pins and printed circuit boards. This application has since expanded to multi-chip modules and stacked die applications. JTAG has moved beyond the chip boundary to access the chip's own test structures, such as built-in self-tests for verifying internal memory and logic. Enhancements to JTAG have made it easier to apply at a system level, with the ability to access internal subsystems. JTAG has become a preferred method for field testing because it allows circuit access without disassembly. Design debugging is another application for JTAG because it enables an unobtrusive way to access the state of the system. It so that's the uh, basic concept behind the boundary scan. We also uh, discussed how JTAG could be used um, for uh, programming FPGAs. So, I would look at that JTAG video to get an overview of the boundary scan. What else we got? Yes. Um, I remember something, one of the questions that confused me from the midterm was the not being able to like program an SR latch on a PAL. Uh, and you said something about like there being a feedback mechanism that it needs and it didn't have that, but I don't recall. Well, that you can't do a latch if your logic is being implemented in LUTs because you need a feedback PAL. Right, as you said, but could you expand on that? Uh, yeah, uh, the, if you look at the LUT implementation, what you got these are the inputs and those are the outputs so the data only flows from left to right mm -hmm. so on the latch you've got to have that feedback path. So somehow I've got to get an input here around to one of the address lines. Right. Uh, I guess in principle you could do that if you're you could using a memory one. device um, as a LUT, but in a configurable logic block, there aren't any feedback paths. And so you've really got to screw around with and actually take it over, I guess, multiple LUTs that are cascaded in order to 
it'll last. Mm -hmm. Of course, dealing with registers is no problem because each configurable logic block has got multiple registers in it. And the let's would provide your excitation equation implementation. Assuming this is a microprocessor, MP microprocessor. And then the second question, and this, these two will be tied together. going to generate n bit addresses and the memory chips are each going to need m address lines. <coughs> now obviously n is greater than m. Okay. Now Now I'm going to ask that question, what does the value n minus m tell you? Oh, how many shifts you can have, memory shifts, because those are grenades. Uh, indirectly, yes. More generally, this tells you how many address lines are available for decoding. So, for example, uh, the processor is generating a 20-bit address, and I'm using uh, 
M is 17, so these are 128K chips. That means I have three address lines available for decoding. I can accommodate up to eight chips. So, you use the available address lines for uh, answering this question here, tells you number of address lines available for decoding. to generate your chip select. Now, bear in mind, whatever this number happens to be, you can accommodate. Let's say that this number is equal to K, okay? That means you can have up to two to the K memory chips. that in this particular example would have 17 address lines. Now, let's suppose that I've got the maximum memory size. So I'm going to have eight of these memory chips. Let's suppose that these memory chips are 128K by 8. You now have to look at the third question, which I'll put up here. Is how wide is the data bus? If these chips are 128K by 8, and I have a 16-bit wide data bus, I've got to activate a pair of chips at a time, each chip providing eight bits of the data. So it would actually be two to the K times two. If it's a 32-bit data bus, and I got 128K by eight memory chips, I'm going to need four memory chips activated at a time, each chip providing eight of the 32 bits. So you would have 2K times four. Okay? So the example we looked at, the data bus was eight bits wide, the memory chips were eight bits wide, so all I had to worry about was how many memory chips are needed for my system, and that would uh, this N minus M would tell me how many address lines I have available to decode for chip selects and chip enables. But you may have to multiply that by a number to get sufficient data for each read and write operation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? Say how wide is the what address bus? Microprocessor. Microprocessor. So there's a whole bunch of questions that can come out of this uh, concept. I could say, give you N and M on a question and say, so largest, how many memory chips would you need? I could say I have a processor that oh, I have got uh, a certain size memory chip constructed a memory system. How many address lines do I need for decoding? So I can access the uh, appropriate memory chip. So there's a lot of variations I can use. But these are the two questions you need to ask 
And then once you've made that determination, figure this out, figure out how many address lines you're going to need for decoding, and then whatever that turns out, you've got your memory system, you may have to now multiply that to get sufficient data for a read or write In modern computer memory, what's the difference between something like DDR4 and DDR3? DDR3 and DDR4? Like, what's the differences between like that? Those. Well, those are dual density RAMs. Uh, they're they work along the concept of the synchronized DRAM, except they actually work on both clock pulses edges. Uh oh. So they work on both the positive and the negative edge. So you can get, in effect, like twice the data rate. DDR, dual data rate. What do the numbers at the end mean? Is it just like iteration or like? I think in 350, so it's still 371? The microprocessor course that you take. Sure. That's the one. Uh, it's 371. Uh, and there you get into some of those memory devices. Uh, because I think, don't hold me to this, but I think they're using an ARM processor as the baseline processor to discuss microprocessor design. Um, and that's large in terms of address bus size and data bus size. Uh, and because of the speed of some of those, you're going to have to resort to the dual data rate RAMs uh, to get the transfer rates that you need between the processor and memory. Anything else? Uh, what's the policy on the uh, you know, scan bits and outside resources for the final I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, what's the policy for canvas, paper notes, and outside resources yeah, for the final? You can use whatever you want to except somebody else. So if you've got some book you want to bring in, uh, you want to look up stuff on the internet, that's fine. As long as you're not communicating with somebody else, okay. you can use whatever you want to on the test. Thank you. Okay, going once, going twice, we're done.